Korangi Kinuga, Paptunu Kiraro, Matangata, Te Wanganui, Tia Mauriora. Padianunga Tai or Mehi, Kinatini Waka, Nunga Hawe Fa, Kate Mehi, Kate Mehi, Kate Mehi. Katira, Tikaana, Kamehi Kitakura, Uhine Waiora, Tika Pupiri of the Mana Kahapoi, Itina Yonga, Kaipapa. Tena kaitai, tena kaitai, tena kaitai kato. Koe matai, we are tukuna teraki. Us three are part of 25 staff in uh, just around the corner in Addington, and uh, we specialise in social innova social innovation. But we look to our tukuna wisdom and processes of te ao Māori to shape equity and education, employment and income for mungā tanga takato for Aotearoa and for the Ngātahi Takiwa. Ko ai au, ko taupiri te maunga, ko waikato te awa, ko tainu i te waka, ko hutiroa te tangata, ko hauraki te moana, ko waikato tainu i te iwi, ko Ngāti Tamaoho te hapu, ko mangatangi te marae, ko tainu i pompi a hau. Kia ora. Our goal, like I said earlier, is for basically equity in all spaces so that our people thrive without having these barriers of education, employment, so that they can achieve the things that they want. And all those things. But um, the whakapapa for us, for this kaupapa that we're here today to talk about ending streaming, uh, in 2019, we released the report, or Tukuna released it, the Hiawararo report, and then in uh, 2021, the ending streaming. I just want to talk a little bit about Hiawararo. It talks uh, about the journey of over 70,000 rangatahi and their journeys through education. And so I just want to share a little bit about my whakapapa through education. And that starts in around 1995, 96, when I was at Kohanga And so that was incredible. It was a beautiful exposure to Te Ao Māori, provided me with a foundational level of understanding of where my, our people come from. And then from there, I moved to Kurokopapa, but because the real wasn't something that was spoken in my whare, I was moved to mainstream. And from there, I ended up in a primary school in Ōtara, 274 South Auckland and it was rich in Pacifica heritage, culture and diversity and then um, yeah it was awesome, it was in the heart of South Auckland and we call it the home of the brave, mm. we're proud of it and from there I did, um, we moved to Kirikiriroa, Hamilton and that was probably the first time I started to notice the effects of streaming. Like I went from a decile one in South Auckland to a now a school of decile eight where all these new technologies, there's a computer room. I'd never seen a computer in a school at that point. And I was like, whoa, there's a whole room full of these things. So that was when I started seeing the disparities and the attitudes from teachers to the bilingual unit and to the mainstream. And they were like, oh, them and us. So it was quite obvious from the age of what, 12, 13, when you're an intermediate. I ended up back in um, Tamaki, finished off my um, intermediate there, and then I was back to the decile twos, the low stuff, and I was like, oh, okay, this is reality. This is back to where I was comfortable. And But the streaming really didn't start till I moved to Taranaki in a small town, and I was there, and as a brown, Māori boy from South Auckland lumped into these low expectation classes where I wasn't even tested or anything to be into these and assumptions were made and not just from the staff but the students as well and this, this is where bullying started and so I was standing up for myself and ending up in these fights which I don't condone but it meant I got expelled from the school and ended up down this spiral of alternative education. I was fortunate enough by the end of that year nine to go back to school for the end of year exams, which I'll get back to in a bit. But from there, the teachers were quite clear to remind me that I had not been in mainstream school, so why try? Why do the, why do the test? 
you haven't been in mainstream school for the last six months, you've been in alternative ed. And so I was like, well, okay, whatever. And then this basically fed uh, fuel for the flames for students to carry on this bullying culture, like, oh, you're just a brown kid who's come from up north and you're back now, what's the point in you trying? More fights happening, more bullying, more stuff like that. Which happened right in front of the corridor, just like out here, in front of the deputy. A fight, massive one. Expelled again. This deputy said, nah, you're not, you're not good enough for this school. You're one of the worst students I've ever seen in my whole teaching career. And imagine that, being a little 13 year old kid hearing that, and you're like, mm -hmm. far out. That's great. Awesome news. Ended up back into alternative education. And something for me personally, like the education journey is something that I've always wanted to pursue. I've always liked to learn. And so I had to go back through the most challenging environment where I'm surrounded by students who are destined to be either young parents, on the dole, in the justice system, or on track to prison. And these are young gang members or prospects in these places. And I was like, how did I end up here? Working my way through these three different organizations, having to prove myself, going through. And then I ended up back to the point where I could go back to a high school, because they said, oh, you're, you're rehabilitated in some kind of aspects. So I get back to this new high school, Spotswood College. And then the deputy there was the one who kicked me out from the first school. <laughs> so here I am trying to explain, I'm, I'm a change, I'm reformed. And what do you call it? Fortunately enough, I was actually at, given the chance to go back to school. This was in early year 10. So I get back to school, I start actually committing myself to learning. And this is where I'm actually starting to choose the subjects that I'm liking in year 11. Started doing NCA. Got my UE by the end of the year, started pursuing it. Year 13 comes along. I made house captain, I made prefect, and left with the UE. But I'd gone through all these different struggles from an assumption from a deputy principal making that you don't like education, you're gonna end up on the dole. But from there, I was left school and then I decided to have a career in the New Zealand Army, so I did a bit of time in the Defence Force. From there I said, that's not me, like I've had enough. I became an electrician, worked all over Aotearoa, saw all different parts, worked in steel mills, sawmills, baby milk factories, worked at the Auckland Airport, and also did one of the main commercial um, sites in Auckland, looking after 20, staff from this kid from South Auckland who was destined to be in prison. And now I get to have the privilege to be able to support rangatahi and work in the space like Tukuna and create opportunities into employment through Hetuki, down at Ara, provide better opportunities in education and this kaupapa for streaming so that he awara araro doesn't repeat and my journey is represented in that story, but I would like for that to be the last. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where my cordial finishes. I just want to mahi to him for being so vulnerable and opening up with such a personal mm. story. Um, that story I think many of our people um, can relate to, and I think it's those stories that are needed um, to help change the mindsets um, around streaming um, and sharing our personal experiences is kind of key to shifting away from this damaging practice. Um, so I just wanted to mihi to Tainui for that. Uh, also, I should introduce myself. So kia ora koutou, ko kai staples to kungwa. Uh, he uri tēnei o na iwi o nai tahu te aroa e Ngāpuhi. Um, so I myself, um, is, I'm a part of the academy at Tōpuna as well with uh, Tainui and um, I've been here for, I've been at Tōpuna for just uh, for a year and a half, just over a year and a half now and streaming was the first kaupapa that our cohort um, was introduced to so I've kind of been nurturing um, this kaupapa alongside Pirapi since it's arrived and it's become basically another one of my um, babies in a way and I really um, 
feel privileged to be in this space and helping create um, the systems change that we're after by ending streaming. So, um, te tū tikanga, the process that we've taken um, around ending streaming. So, um, many of you might have been there or heard about the stakeholders hui that we held back in May of last year, and the karanga was put out then around how can we end streaming? What is everybody going to do? We've got plenty of agencies, um, plenty of people in the system that are willing to make the change, so how can we do that collaboratively? So, we um, convened a design team of diverse education experts from October through to June of this year, who the wonderful Helen was a part of as well. Um, and it was through that design process where, where we met once a month for two days. Um, and it was through that process our three pro emerged, um, or our three levers of change. So we've got Fano as one PO, and originally that Fano and community were separate and sitting in their own PO, but we merged them together because ultimately Fano the community, community are Fano. So they are the first um, lever of change we identified, followed by the pedagogy. Obviously, we're trying to change the practice of streaming, so that was a very um, prevalent um, lever, of lever of change as well, alongside the system in itself. So that, they are our three levers of change, as well as we call them our PO. And it was through that process, once those PO emerged, we knew that we needed to create a really cohesive strategic action plan that's digestible and relatable for all audiences. And one thing that I noticed through our co-design process was how awareness was a really, really vivid theme. Um, around obviously changing anything, we need to be aware about the issue we are trying to change. So hence that being the first A. So we've called it the AAA framework. We've got um, awareness is the first A. Alternatives is our second A, because obviously we're trying to find an alternative to streaming. And then the really like simple one, we need to action that. So that is our AAA framework that was magically dreamt up out of my really weird brain that ticks over at really weird hours, and um, I was thinking, how are we going to put this document together and make it make sense? But I didn't want our PO to sit separate, I wanted them to be together. So that is why we um, came up with our AAA framework. Uh, so, <coughs> Te Pūtaki, the, the root cause or the reason why we believe streaming is still prevalent. Um, obviously, um, streaming derives from what we know to be normal. Um, we think the practice of streaming is normal because it's what we're used to, it's the bread and butter of classrooms and education and how we teach. Um, but when we look at the whakapapa of streaming, we realise that this practice is rooted in colonisation that has been carved in all structures that we currently sit in. And it's through this... Um, it's through colonisation that we see our people sitting at the bottom statistically. And I think we're all really aware of the statistics behind Māori and Pacific Urban. All the rest of it, don't need to unpack that one just right now. Um, but if we also look at um, the autonomy of schools, every school is on island and that in itself um, means that there isn't as much power that schools can hold because they are on their own. And we know that um, to create change, you need more than one person. And if we're all on the same locker, then we're going to get there faster. Um, another key aspect around why streaming still exists is there's plenty of research. And I think you guys may, you know, you will be all aware of the research and all the academic papers that point out all the damage streaming is doing. Yet the data behind that doesn't actually seem to be existing. So there is no baseline kind of data around what streaming currently looks like in Aotearoa. We can't tell you how many schools are streaming. We wouldn't know how many students have been streamed. But from the whakapapa of how this practice has been brought into the system, I could tell you that it's probably thousands of people that have been affected and are still being affected by streaming. So that is a real key um, issue, uh, root cause around streaming that we're looking to change. And I can touch on that very very, very sh shortly. 
Next. So we've got the first A that I'm going to speak to. Um, so obviously streaming is intergenerational. If we've talked about the fucker papa, it's ingrained into all structures and it's invisible. So because of the invisibility of this practice, um, awareness is um, our first day as well as the pivotal change that um, is needed. Um, so if I look at a little bit about my personal experience as well, before Tokuna Taraki, I wouldn't have known what streaming was when we came into the space and jumped into the co-papa and I was talking about streaming. I was like, oh, streaming, Netflix, um, <laughs> Chromecast. Um, I, made, I was thinking, oh, I thought we were in a social innovation lab, didn't realise I was in tech. Um, <laughs> And then they explained exactly what streaming was and then the term cabbage class and extension class and those kind of things were brought up and then I was like, oh, streaming. I know what that looks like, I know what that feels like, I know what that sounds like. I just didn't know that that was a practice because it's so invisible. And I think many of our whanau know exactly what that streaming um, looks like and feels like. It's just we kind of just took it as a normal way of being in education. Um, so, yeah, that's what happened when I first came. Um, my two boys in the picture here, um, it was through my experience at Tokuna that I was able to reflect on my journey through education and realise that I went through, um, all the way to through to year 13, to leave school with NCA Level 1, and it was through the reflections of my learnings at Tokuna that I realised that I was the outcome my edu educational outcome was because of I was streamed. And one of the other really harmful things streaming is doing is it's affecting the whole order and the mental well-being of our tamariki and our rangatahi. Um, and I've seen that firsthand with my two tamariki, um, especially my oldest boy. Um, he's come to me and said he's noticed his friends are in um, the top reading group and he thinks he must be in the bottom group because he's never placed in the same groups as them. So he mustn't be as smart as them and he's already making those assumptions about himself that he's not as good as or as brainy as the other kids. And I think that's something that we're all aware of. Kids make those you know, assumptions. I think we've all grown up and been in classrooms and thought, oh man, am I as smart as him? Or am I, you know, we all kind of compare ourselves. It's a natural, uh, thing that we, you know, it's a natural thing that we do, but it's the fact that streaming creates this in the classroom, and it's actually something that we can remove to make sure we're not creating harm for our tamariki. Um, so yeah, we can um, raise awareness around streaming by we're looking at doing a social media campaign and sharing the impacts of both high and low stream students because we know it's not just the low stream students that are being impacted by streaming. It's also those kids that are in the high extension classes. They face a lot of other different kind of pressures um, and I know that it's affecting their mental well-being as well, having to stay at the top or also that social exclusion from not having the same um, social groups and things like that. So we look at sharing the stories of those people, both high and low, obviously sharing the, narr the narrative behind streaming and once we get this data we can start releasing and sharing actually what the data is behind streaming and what that looks like. <coughs> so we know that, uh, we've heard this many times, not one size fits all yet we have an education system that's currently delivering that and I think we just need to be a little bit more diverse around the pedagogy in the classroom to make sure we're cre creating spaces and learning that all tamariki can thrive in. And <coughs> now I'll pass the rako to Parabi. Oh, kia ora everyone. Uh, to tei, taku mihi nui kia koutou katoa. Um, kia koe, Christine um, Tumaku o te kura nei, he tino mihi nui ki a koe. Kia ora. Uh, ko ai ahau, ko Piripi Predias Taku Ingoa, um, Ngāti, Ngāti Pākia Te Iwi. Just thank you for the opportunity to come and have a bit of a kōrero to you. And I just want to acknowledge Kai and Tainui, the journeys that they've shared. No prizes. If you had to predict my journey, I'm pretty sure you could all predict it. 
So I grew up in Christchurch in the 1960s. Schools were very stream, you know, top to bottom. And I went through the top streams. And so I was one of the ones who was advantaged by the system. And I'm conscious that there was a huge number who are disadvantaged and left school very early um, in life. So that's my part of the story. Um, what I wanted to do is just go through, if, if we take streaming away, the question is, what do we replace it with? And that's something a lot of schools are grappling with. And so what I wanted to have a look at is, and again, I think you can tell we're sort of taking little bits and pieces out of the report that we're writing this call to action. And so I'm just going to take some bits and pieces about how we can do things um, very differently. And I wanted to start off with that Fano community, Rangatahi Po. And when I think back to it, we've got research going back to, I think, 1932, showing that streaming um, is damaging. So what's that, 90 years of research? And we've done nothing about it. And I start to think, if way back in 1932, schools had gone and asked students, you know, gone with real sincerity and asked students what they think about the system, how it could be improved, maybe decades and decades ago, we would have got rid of streaming and um, prevented some of this damage that's been happening um, for taking place. And so when you think about um, whānau community rangatai, you know, just some ideas. What about going to rangatai and setting up systems and processes where we can get their voice? And I know many schools now are actually you know, going and getting um, student focus groups and so on. But what about taking that a step further and yeah, setting up that process around it? Um, you know, what about training rangatai so they can actually manage and facilitate the whole process and do that? Um, and at the moment often we just get rangatahi voice and it sits in a report somewhere. What about having rangatahi and schools involved in implementing the suggestions that they came up with so they're part of the process? And what about going a step further, what about having annual conferences, regional conferences, national conferences for rangatahi about education? And that would work in very easily with, um, with iwi. So these are some of the things we've been talking about, the alternatives. But again, just from my own experience, you know, I always say to myself, never, never underestimate um, the depth of whakaaro that comes out of students. And they seem to be able to nail it very, very simply. You know, what's happening, what needs to change. Um, our job really is just is to listen and empower them to act on it. Can we go to the next slide? So thinking about alternatives and systems change and we could go through all the different agencies and um, that are involved in this in the education sector but for today I've just wanted to focus on boards of trustees and you'll have had way more experience than I will have about the board of trustees but some questions for them to ask you know how representative are they of the community they serve of community of rangatai um, the hapu in whose area they lie, and so on. You know, what more could they be doing to gather that, um, that representation? So that's a challenge um, put down to the boards of trustees. And, and not only just listening to what Rangatahi is saying, setting up a better system, instead of having one or two student reps on the board, setting up a better system so that their whakaaro is being fed in, and more importantly, that it's valued, yeah, I've heard some people say that, yeah, some boards, they don't actually value what young people say and they are dismissive of it. Um, and then the other one I was just going to mention was, you know how you have these random conversations and we all went through a facil some facilitation <coughs> training a couple of weeks ago and one of the facilitators had come down from Wellington and she was the previous chair of Onslow College Board of Trustees and just over a cup of tea she was telling me about how they've moved to co-governance and she said it's been a little bit of bit tricky with some of the rules and regulations but they've found a way around it and they've set up a really workable simple situation um, system and that's working really well so there's just something um, around boards of trustees um, in terms of pedagogy 
we've been really lucky because over the last year we've been out visiting schools and finding out that when schools have stopped ability grouping in particular, you know, what have they replaced it with? And you can see the photo there of Tainui and Linda Broadbent, who was the new entrant teacher at Corina School in East Puriru. And we spent an afternoon with her and she was giving us a bit of a 101 course in Dimmock. And it was just fascinating and, and absolutely uplifting. Her whole school does it and I think the three schools in their area have been working with Dimmock for the last eight years and some real powerful research behind it. Um, Kaya might remember we had a long drive to Waitaki <laughs> Valley School. <laughs> I did something really dumb. I arranged for us to go and visit Waitaki Valley School, which I thought was at Waimati. I thought that's two hours drive. So Kaya dropped off her kids at school, came along, nine o'clock we got in the car, and just as I was leaving, I said, oh, yeah, we're going to Waitaki Valley at Waimati, and this workmate said, uh-uh, you're not going there, you're going to Kurao. And I said, oh, is that just yeah, a couple of miles up the road? And he went, no, no, no. So we had to <laughs> rock it down to get to Waitaki Valley School. But it was worth, because they were looking, they were, they'd stopped ability grouping, and were working particularly around Joe Bowler's Mindset Maths. Um, I was lucky enough to visit Viscount Primary School in Mangere, and um, they've really got into reciprocal teaching and RT3T. And that was fascinating, just walking around the school and the classrooms all in sort of little groups, um, each person in the group having a role as they were doing their reading or their maths. And the principal was saying that um, the school, I think, is 90% Pacific Island, and coming from bigger families, and she said, the reciprocal teaching works really well because she said these students are used to you know, working as a group, whether it's in the church or at home, everyone having their roles and things. And the reciprocal teaching, um, yeah, it was fascinating. I'll just go back a minute, Kaya, sorry. Um, when we started doing this, I thought it was like a menu and you just chose one thing. And what I've realised that in actual fact, it's more like you know, out of my garage, you've got a job to do. And if you've got a, that particular job, you go over there and grab that tool, or this job, you go get that tool. And when we were talking to Linda about the Dimmick, she said, oh, yeah, and I use Joe Bowler's math, and you know, she draws on reciprocal teaching and so on. So it's, um, these are all blended together. But I know the particularly pedagogy that's used in primary schools, but uh, reciprocal teaching is in a lot of secondary schools as well, and we've been getting some case studies around that. Thanks, Kai. Um, we've been blessed, haven't we, Helen, working with Professor Christine Ruby Davies, and she has just been wonderful, and she keeps on sort of flattering us, really. She says, this is the pinnacle of my career, this work, and we're in virtually daily contact with her, and she's been talking to us about high expectation teachers, which I think is really what she has developed. And first I thought, oh, yeah, it just means in your mindset you think, yep, yeah, my class, they'll all do well. But, you know, she's written some huge books. Um, she runs the training programs around it. And the three principles of high expectation teaching. One, you use, all students are in mixed and flexible groupings, not ability groupings. Two, having clear skill-based learning goals. And three, feeling supported and cared about by teachers and peers. And this is... Um, high expectation teaching you know, is equally applicable to primary as it is to secondary. And I think the research shows that if you're a student and you have a high expectation trained teacher, you will be making two years progress for every one year in that classroom. Um, so that's quite you know, phenomenal. Thanks, Kaya. Um, leadership leading change, and again, it's you know, wonderful talking about this with you know, the people in this room today. Um, the first thing to mention is that you know, there are many, many schools who are well down their path to ending streaming and making change. You know, and Christchurch Girls High School is a wonderful example. But I was just talking to, um, I think, Nicola Belanti from Christ College about the work they're doing there, and I hear Dangidudu working and you know, sorry I will have forgotten a lot of secondary schools in Christchurch who are making great progress in this area and around the country. Um, 
we've been working closely with Grant Congdon, principal of Horofenua College, and he took a sabbatical last term and visited North Island schools, talking to principals really around leadership. And he's done some wonderful case studies for us around this. And just some of the, the common threads that were coming through. Um, one, take your time. Two, make sure you've got your senior leadership team, your board, your staff, your community, iwi, yo, right on side about this. Um, yeah, take your time, don't rush. Uh, what else did he say? Gosh, it's just gone right out of my head. <laughs> he had a whole, whole list of things and it's just neat having those case studies to draw on. Um, and I think, you know, again, Christine, you'll back this up. I, schools are absolutely generous about welcoming visitors who want to come and have a look and learn from other schools. And that's how it should be, learning off our neighbouring schools and you know, sharing our experiences. Um, the other one we're noticing, primary schools seem to be shifting more focused around their pedagogy, but secondary schools, there seems to be a real pattern where streaming, ending streaming, is just one small part of a larger transformational change process. And what seems to be going, again, some common things coming through, uh, um, embedding the Treaty of Waitangi. Um, become centre, um, becoming much more student-centric, students having choice around um, their passions and interests. Um, gosh, what else? Cult a big emphasis on cultural respons um, responsiveness and yeah, so things like that. So that, I just find that very interesting. Um, Hastings Girls High, you know, I think a lot of you would have read about um, their work. Um, and it was interesting just talking to uh, Nicola at Christ College and their diploma system, which is moving that way. So these are some of the things that we're learning on, on our way. And I said, I've just taken little snippets, just tiny snippets of some of the things that we've been covering. And you'll just have to wait till February to find out a bit more what's in our call to action. Hokiati kia koe. Kilda. So the last A, actions. Um, similar to what Pitipi said, you're probably going to have to wait till February to see exactly what those actions are. But something we are doing different um, in terms of our action plan is we're not just recommending what um, the system and those agencies that sit within the system are going to do. We're working collaboratively with them, um, and they will be coming. Uh, they will be creating their statements and their actions and Pitipi and I are going up to Wellington next week to get those in person so we'll be min uh, visiting the Ministry of Education, uh, PPTA and a couple of others, uh, NZDI, CORE, Teaching Council, Teaching Council NZQA. NZQA, so all of those yeah. big um, educational um, people and agencies are all going to be preparing their statements and they will be and their commitments, and that will be printed in um, our action plan. Uh, so that's how we have framed the actions. So what's happening next for us? Something I mentioned, and I think we've mentioned a couple of times, is around the data. So this is a really, really exciting um, piece that's come out of our co-design process. So we've collaborated with PPTA, UCUA, um, and NZDI. Um, to, one, put together a survey and actually um, get that out to all the primary and secondary teachers. Um, so most of you will be getting that delivered in your inbox sometime today. Um, primary's already um, received theirs and I know we've had a really strong response rate. I think it was in two days we had 2,000 responses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so it's looking really, really positive. So I'm really excited to analyse that data and put those results um, in our action plan. Um, and obviously we've got the launch. So we look, plan to launch in September of this year. And because of some comments from the Minister <coughs> and everything that's happening in government at the moment, we got asked to push that out till uh, February of next year. And I was actually quite excited about that because it meant more time for us to really refine what we have so far. Um, but it was also really positive to hear from them that they're really backing this co-papa. Um, they definitely can see um, 
the impact that we're going to get um, by ending streaming. And Minister Calvin Davis um, had ended streaming himself when he was a teacher. And I know Minister Tanetti is really excited and we're looking to meet her, I uh, think, next month. So yeah, watch out, we'll be at Parliament in February of next year. You'll see our beautiful faces somewhere splattered all over social media and TV, maybe, you never know. Um, and then following on from our launch, we'll be um, producing our website, <coughs> our ending streaming website, and that will hold all of our resources, um, a toolkit, um, and all of those things that schools, Farno community are all going to need. Um, and one thing I mentioned earlier around the awareness phase is once we implement, we're looking to run a social media campaign to help raise the awareness because we need community and whānau and everybody to be um, on board this walker. So that means we need to make sure they're aware before we get things in place and policies and systems working to create that change because we want everyone to be on board. Um, and obviously, once we launch next year, we want to be able to fund a phased approach um, to end streaming by 2030. So that's what's happening next for us. Can, we, can I just cut in? Sorry. Um, we've been doing, using Teams to do our PowerPoint, and this morning we're trying to make changes, and yeah, hey, you're banging away at the key and it won't change. And we're trying to add an NZDI. <coughs> we'd fit, forgotten off the survey NZDI. And we're trying to add that in and we couldn't get it in. And then the figure of 130,000 PBDA and NZDI members, this morning we think, someone said that and we thought, doesn't sound right, so we're trying to delete that. So please just take the 130,000 as, <laughs> as a ballpark figure. Um, I'm not sure what it, what it is, but NZDI have been absolutely um, yes, phenomenal in the work they've been doing getting this going. Um, so it's been a really good collaboration, PPDA, um, and PPDA were going to send it out last Wednesday and their key person got sick and so they waited till today because apparently if you send a survey out on a Wednesday, that's the best time for people to open it um, <laughs> and work that out, so <laughs> I learned something this morning. <laughs> so, but the response rate from the NZDI ones that went out has been um, has been really great and as I said the last thing I heard last week was 2000 had responded. I think it might have gone out to principals last week from PPDA. I could be wrong on that um, but certainly secondary teachers are getting it this afternoon. So sorry just that little uh, correction.